Jesus. Before you're seated, would you just pray to me that God would speak to us? Father, somebody. 
rocky surface, uh, preferably where the wind blows, uh, and takes a big rock and he'll roll it and lays the wheat harvest down that he's cut out of the field. And he'll take a rock and he'll roll it over top the wheat, crushing the wheat. Or he'll take a sled that has metal and rock fragments and drag it across there, again, crushing the wheat. He takes a fan in his hand or a window fork and he begins to wave or, or throw it in the air. And the wind blows upon that rocky surface and the wheat is heavier than the husk. And the wheat will fall down, but the husk, which is no good, it's unprofitable, will fly a little bit further off and land over here. He will gather the wheat and put it in the storage. But the husk, that means nothing. The husk that has no profit. The husk that can't do you any good. He will put it in a fire and he will burn it with an unquenchable fire. The whole purpose of the fire in the process is to destroy what is unprofitable. He said he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You just don't talk in tongues, but there's a fire inside that begins to burn everything out of you that is unprofitable. It burns away the husk. There's things in every one of us that are unprofitable to God, and God wants to put a fire down in our bosom and burn the things that bring no profit. And we burned the leaves. 
leaves. And I, I, I've never seen a, a leaf pile that you set on fire and you just walk away from it and the fire's going to burn everything until it's burnt. Yeah. It just don't work that way. You've got to turn the fire. You've got to stoke the fire. You've got to fan the flame. You've got to keep the fire burning. You see, the tendency of the fire is to go out. The fire wants to wane. The fireplace wants to go out. But you've got to stroke the logs. You've got to turn the logs. And you've got a Holy Ghost fire in you. And every day in your prayer, you've got to stroke the fire. You've got to turn the leaves. You've got to make sure everything inside of you gets this. Oh, yeah. He said, Amen. Amen. And this is where we become a living sacrifice. Paul told Romans, I beseech you therefore, by the mercies of God, Romans 12 and 1, that you present, what I said, present your bodies. Present your body a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. You've got you to lay yourself on that altar every day as a living sacrifice. Here I am, God. My life is a living altar. And I want you, God, to accept my sacrifice. I want to live to, to the standard of holiness. How do I do that? Verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. I submit my life and I keep the fire burning. The fire of personal sacrifice, personal revival. Oh God, renew my mind today. What I had yesterday in church. Then the fire that God initiates in my life will go out. I can't afford to let the fire go out. Amen. You can afford to let the fire go out. It determines the depth and the weight of my worship for the rest of my life in God. Keeping the fire burning. I like a little poem that I heard. I met God in the morning. I met God in the morning when the day was at its best. And his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. All day long the presence lingered. All day long he stayed with me. And we sailed in perfect calmness or a very troubled sea. Other ships were blown and battered. Other ships were sore distressed. But the winds that seemed to drive them brought to me a peace and rest. Then I saw that I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of my mind when I too had loosed the moorings with that presence I left behind so I think I know the secret learn from many a troubled way you must seek him in the morning if you walk him through the day you gotta seek him every morning you gotta keep that fire burning or you're gonna drift away you gotta keep that fire burning or you're gonna find yourself in places you wish you'd never been it was time for Moses to make a choice about the pleasure of sin. He immediately said no. When Moses was offered the pleasure of sin, Hebrews tells us he immediately said no. Watch this. Hebrews 11 and 24. By faith when Moses, when he was come to years, refused. He said no. To be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. He said no to the pleasure of sin. By faith, he pursued Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses said no. I'm not going to be Pharaoh's son. I'm not going to be an Egyptian. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to enjoy the life of the pleasure of sin. I will not give my life to the world. And saying no cost Moses. It cost him dearly. Yeah. He lost all his status in the world. He lost all his worldly wealth in Pharaoh's house. He lost his life in Egypt. He wound up on the backside of the desert for 40 years because he said no. 
no. Having said no to sin was great and wonderful. And it was a good thing for Moses to say no. But Moses needs more than to say no. Watch this. Watch this. Moses said no to God, I read it to the world. But he had a problem saying yes to God. You know the story of Moses. He didn't have a problem saying no to Pharaoh's family. He didn't have a problem saying no to sin. But he had a problem saying yes to the call of God. There's many of us in this room, we don't have a problem saying no to sin. I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to cuss, I'm not going to smoke. I'm, I'm not going to live an ungodly lifestyle. But then we got a problem. And God says, but I want you to go. It's good to say no to sin. But can you say yes to God? Moses said no to sin. But he had a bigger problem saying yes to God. And that brings us to what we're dealing with in our text. If God here in this wilderness, God gives Moses an encounter with the fire. But it's not any ordinary fire that comes. Watch this in Exodus 3 and 2. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him, to Moses, in a flame of fire, out of the midst of the bush. Everybody say he looked. Everybody say he hoped. The bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Now I want you to hear me. If you study the scripture, at first glance, you can be deceived. But if you read it over a couple of times, you really get an understanding of it. What got Moses' attention of the bush was not the voice of God. It was the fire. He saw a bush that was burning. And, and, and it caught his attention. The angel of the Lord spoke to him after he turned aside. After he inquired of God. Is when God spoke to him. Watch, watch, watch. How long do you have to look at something that is on fire before you realize that this began to deal with me a couple months back in our church? How long have you got to watch something on fire before you realize it ain't getting burnt? Now that takes a while. I've passed by a lot of house fires in my life and kept going. Because I just assume it's burnt. When you see something on fire, you just assume. When you come back tomorrow, it's going to be consumed. It took some time. Watch now, I'm not going to miss what we need today. It took some time for Moses to inquire the fire. To realize Something is going on here. Something different yeah. is happening right here in this place. I've seen, I've seen, I remember one time my wife and I was at a restaurant down in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And there was a fireplace. And the logs were burning. And I mean they were on fire. About, about halfway through, halfway through my meal, I began to realize this is not something right. Yeah. Nobody stoked it. The more I looked at it, I began to realize there's no smoke coming from it. And then I began to realize there were gas logs. Yeah. Very, very expensive gas logs, but they were, they were nice gas And it looked like it was on fire. Yeah. It took me a while to realize it wasn't being consumed. Yeah. Moses looked at this bush saw it on fire. And in that arid, arid Middle East, he could have been right on just like they do in California when things catch fire. We just come back to California a few weeks back and, and everything in, inland from the coast, not on the coast, but inland, it's arid. It's dry. And there's a lot of fire. And when you see a fire in California, you just keep going. You, just, you don't stop. You just keep going. And you just assume it's going to be consumed. Yeah. Moses lives in the same kind of air place. He sees a bush on fire. He could have just kept right on going. But he began to inquire this fire. He began to look and study this fire. 
And here's the point. Moses must have really checked out that bush on fire. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And he said, I will now turn aside yeah. and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt? In Exodus 3 and 4, Tell me to worship God. 
tell me to praise God. Instead, he got eternal. All right. All right. He says in his mind, he thought, you wait. You make that all the call. He said, I ain't leaving. In his mind, he says, I'm not leaving you until I get a And my dad got on that altar with a determination, and this is me back in the 1920s, fell on his knees in that old wood church in Kingsport, Tennessee, and began to seek God. And after a little while of seeking God, not caring who's looking, he was inquiring the fire. He began to lift up his hands, and, and he said that he would say, Hallelujah! 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 I'm so much to go he showed up and he said his pastor jumped down and smacked him in the back. He said, Wham! He said, That's the Holy Ghost, boy. Let it go. And my dad began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave him words. And he talked in tongues. The fire fell on him for a good two hours. The whole church testified of how that day George Akers got the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the 1920s and talked in tongues for the better part of two hours. A woman had a spirit of prophecy come over her. And she walked up, mumbling through a spirit, just kind of stubborn, st had a stand her lips in it. She took her Bible and she laid it on my dad's head. And she looked up to heaven and she began to prophesy. This is going to become an oracle of the Word of God. This young man is going to become a man of God, a pioneer of the faith. And my dad pioneered the faith in Kingsport, Tennessee, in Oxford, Pennsylvania, Wilmington, North Carolina, in Sanford, North Carolina. Churches were started all up and down because of that. Because a boy said, there's a fire in this place, and I'm not going to ridicule it. I'm going to inquire it. These people that are shouting and acting silly, there's something else going on. And I'm going to find out what's happening in this church in Mishawaka, Indiana. I'm going to find out what's making that pastor act that way. What's making that song be act that way. What's making these women act that way. I'm going to get in the altar. I'm going to inquire the fire. We need to inquire the fire. None of that would have ever happened. My dad would have never been in anything. He probably would have grown up just a another ordinary person. Had he not on that morning and said, not on your life. Yeah. I'm staying right here until I get what I need. I'm not going to let go till I get what I need. Too many times we don't stop to really talk. Can I, can I speak to anybody today? Maybe you have never spoken in tongues as the Spirit gave you others. Maybe you've never really had a deep encounter with God. Can I encourage you to do something? This fire that you saw up here today in the worship, don't just pass by it. Yeah. Come on. Join us. Amen. Take time to inquire. Amen. Yes. Take time to find out. Is there really something about this? Yeah. Is there something? Because if there is something about this, it's not just for these folks. Amen. It's for everybody. Amen. It's for whosoever will let him come and drink of the water of life freely. This is for you. Amen. Everybody in this place. Yes, we need to take time to talk. There's a whole lot more folks that would receive a whole lot more from them. And more would receive the Holy Ghost if they would spend more time pondering yeah. and inquiring the fire that they don't understand. Getting baptized in water is something that Acts 2 38. We all know that scripture. Acts 2 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent? Yes. And be baptized? Yeah. In, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ. Okay, I want to make sure y'all are still with me this day. Amen. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus Christ. Peter told them to do two things. Peter told him to do two things. Repent. Yeah. Right. Do that. That's right. The third thing is God. 
The first two things, you know, if, if I had my way, I'd, I'd have everybody in Sanford to repent. We got a guy in our church named Frank Westfall. He's a bodybuilder. Frank, Frank, in his past, he doesn't do it anymore, but in his past, he professionally was a bodybuilder. And I mean, the dude looks like he's got boulders for arms. If I, if, if I had my way, I'd tell Frank, but Frank, you go back there and get that guy, and I want you to drag him to this arm.
the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. By the time that day was over, 3,000 people inquired the fire. 3,120 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I wonder today, as we close this service, if you've never received the Holy Ghost, if you've never received salvation, if you have any question mark about your walk with God, you don't have to leave here today with a question mark. You can leave here today with a peace in your mind that you know everything God has for you. I wonder right now if everyone in this room could go home by way of the altar. Before we see the lobby, if everybody would see the altar, if we could come together and lift up.